Hey there, I'm Cindy Coaches, and I am the host of Pen to Paper Press Podcast. I sit down with best-selling authors, writers, editors, publishers, and creative souls in my virtual studio to talk about the process of developing our stories to completing our works of art. Each episode is an opportunity for us to explore mindsets, pearls of wisdom, and the experiences that began our journey as a writer from the moment we put pen to paper. In this episode, I'm speaking with Deborah Keevan, the founder and chief inspirational officer of Highlander Press. Debbie is a writer, editor, and truly enjoys guiding the change makers to share their stories. Debbie is a graduate of Stanford University Novel Writing Program and is currently pursuing a master's degree in publishing. Hi, Debbie. Welcome to Pen to Paper Press Podcast Studio. I've been looking forward to our conversation and talking about the elements of editing and publishing. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be with you. Um, I follow you all on your travels, and so this is just a delight. (laughs) Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, I've kind of been around the block a time or two. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't we all? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. And I know that you like to travel as well. The wandering heart, it's it uh, leads us to many adventures. So your book title, you've written your book, Now What?, is the perfect lead-in for our conversation. The obvious question would be, what motivated you to write the book? But what I'm curious about is, you wrote a book. What was next for you? Oh, such a good question. Um, The book, ironically, is already in a second revision, and I decided it's a series. So that's what's next. I'm breaking (laughs) it down into you're thinking about writing a book. Now what? You've published a book. Now what? And you've... um, you've written a book now what? So the three. So really talking about what goes into writing a book, that first draft, really, um, how to select an editor and how to know when your book is worthy of publishing. And then, you know, you've written your book now what, which is really all about the ways to get your book published. So it's whether you decide you want to go the traditional route, the self-publishing route or where I love to play is in that hybrid space, but telling people, you know, what to expect and what, you know, what each of those means from an author business perspective. And then um, the last book in the series, you published your book. Now what is really about the ongoing marketing without sounding like a guy in Washington square park with his, you know, trench coat open, trying to sell you something, check it out, <laughs> check it out, check it out. I got a book. Because we don't ever want to have that kind of feeling, right? We want to have the, oh, you've written a book. Tell me more kind of a feeling. (laughs) I love the visual with that. Absolutely, Debbie. That is awesome. Yeah. And it's, you know, trench coat wide open. Right, right. Or dressed. (laughs) (laughs) Um, (laughs) There is a question that lingers in the minds of most writers without you know, throughout the writing process. And as you know, why would anyone want to read this book uh, is that question. This question can be the compass that leads the author's direction. And for others, it's the reason they pause, you know, and allow it to arrest for duration of time. And then eventually it's it's what stops them from typing all together and and filling those pages what is one pearl of wisdom for the person who gets caught up in that mental loop of why would anyone want to read this book such a great question and and so there's really two the first is i want to just completely normalize that feeling because every person who writes a book feels that way at some point and usually multiple points along the whole journey. (laughs) The second is, is surrounding yourself with other authors. And that's really crucial because when you're surrounded by other people who are going through the same thing, you can realize that you're not alone 
that it is completely normal. And then they can reach out that hand and pull you up out of what I call the molasses swamp of doubt and, and really help you move forward with your story because I'm guilty. I've written two novels and this is going to be really funny story in that I wrote one novel as my marriage was coming to an end and I did not want to publish it while I was still married. So I literally put everything in a box and I put the box underneath my feet and I rested my feet on it every day. So it was there and it was in my consciousness. And I was talking with um, a mastermind group that I'm a part of. And I said, you know, I'm really, I'm publishing all these great books, but I'm really yearning to get back to my own publication. And someone said to me, well, where's your book right now? I said, it's under my feet. Ooh. <laughs> so that was, it was there. It was done. It was incomplete. It needed another rivet. It definitely needed a polish. I've had that done. And so it's a matter of where is your book? Is it in your drawer? Is it in your heart? Change your perspectives and know that regardless of whether you're writing fiction or nonfiction, nobody has your voice. Nobody has your ideas. Even if someone else has written something in the same genre, the same vein, the same everything, fill in the blank. It hasn't been done by you. Yeah. And that uniqueness is so crucial. Yes, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, our words, they, you know, I, I somehow coined the phrase and it started when I started saying it before as I was setting up the website and, and really getting into doing the podcast and stuff is your words have power and your story matters. And it's really funny because I'm in the process of writing two books. I have several novels that have been started one or two of them that are complete and blah, blah, blah. And that is one of the things that I keep uh, catching myself on is, ooh, my story does matter. I need to get this out. I need to do something with it. And in speaking with other writers, you know, we do hear that, well, it's already been written. Why, why would I want to keep doing this? And that is the one message that keeps coming up is the fact that your voice is so important and only you can say it your way and it's your perceptions that come across on the page it's your energy it's your life force it's you and nobody else like you (laughs) exactly and so the question then becomes is where is your book is it under your feet and if it is you know finds a a tribe of, of other authors who can help you through that process of dusting it off and evaluating it and getting it done, getting it out there, because there's nothing like being on the other side and realizing that the ego. So I, I, I always talk about the ego as my, my ego is the gremlin. It sits on my shoulder and it whispers in my ear, you know, who are you? Why would anyone want to listen to you? You're not that good. You know, who do you think you are? And so I literally picture myself picking him up by the scruff. And it's for some reason, it's a man. I don't know why it's a (laughs) little hairy little monster. I pick him up by the scruff of his neck and I put him in a gerbil ball and I gently kick him away, (laughs) just away. Like, thank you. I know you're trying to keep me safe, but I don't need that anymore. Yes. I like that. And, and what's really ironic about you saying, um, uh, who am I to write this? One of the chapters that I start one of the books that I'm currently working on is titled, who am I to write this? And, and it's really funny because of the fact that we do fall into that mindset of who am I to do that? And, and so pick it apart. Why? (laughs) why not you exactly you know, and and so forth so one thing i wanted to hit on is editing because i know you've been you've been editing for a, a very very long time <laughs> probably since i could hold a pen <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um one 
um, something that comes up is when you talk about editing, it can scare the bejeebies out of so many writers new and, and, you know, those writers that have already published uh, several, you know, um, well, whether it's articles, books, you know, right. pod, or uh, blog posts, whatever, doesn't matter. They've heard the horror stories of editors completely hacking up their storylines and rearranging content to the point that it's unfamiliar, um, you know, to them. And the biggest fear of all, of course, is the editor telling them that the book is utter crap and would be better served underneath, you know, the bird cage, <laughs> or as the liner for a bird cage. And, you know, you and I have both heard people share this. Uh, and I, you know, I have not experienced it yet. But I haven't worked with the editor in, in that state yet. Right. Um, so you may have. Um, but I'd like to take down a uh, breakdown, excuse me, uh, the types of editors and their roles as a way to lessen some of the anxieties uh, for those that are, you know, in the stage of working on the written works. So it doesn't feel like I'm putting you on the spot or like this is a high school pop quiz. <laughs> I'm good. That's... You can ask me anything. <laughs> Okay. Well, I went to your website and, you know, I wanted to highlight a few of the definitions, but if you're golden with it, there are different types of editors right? and, and there's so much confusion about who does what and, and when. So, so let's tackle the, uh, well, not tackle, I guess that's, you know, you and I are very visual talkers. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so tackling the, the developmental editor is probably the inappropriate wording because we don't want to hurt that because that's what you and I both do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't want to be tackled. <laughs> well, and so you, you, you bring up a couple of things that are just so important. And the number one important thing is any editor who just tells you your stuff is crap, run run the other way because everybody's first draft is crap. Yes, it is. It's just crap. And it should be, you should be romping all over the page and not reining things in. And a really great developmental editor will be able to see the golden pearls or not, pearls are not golden, but golden gems <laughs> that are in your words and help you polish your work and rearrange your story in a way that makes it more compelling, but actually makes your voice even clearer. Right. Because the, the role of a, a really gifted developmental editor is to really see what's not being said between the lines and then help identify and pull all that yumminess forward yes. and actually give you something that you're like, I wrote that. That's the feeling you want to have when you work with an editor. You won't always have that feeling because then we get into the copy editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's my, who's the, the red pen editor, if you will. That's the person who checks your grammar, who makes sure that you've got synchronicity in your, in your tenses and your, your um, points of view, and that the word choices that you've made are the best choices to strengthen your sentence. Um, but the copy editor comes later, but the developmental editor is really there to help you shape a story. So for example, if you're writing a memoir, you may decide that the easiest way to write that memoir is to write it linearly as things happened. Because a memoir, again, just remembers a slice of your life. It's not your whole life. It's a slice. Right. And so when you're writing that slice, to write it may make sense to you to, to write it linearly. But a really good developmental editor will look at the story and say, maybe you would want to consider moving this part up here. And the developmental editor will also say, I want to give you permission to tell me no, because it's your story. Oh, I like that. Uh, you know, and, yeah. and I learned that at Stanford is like, you can make suggestions and critical recommendations, but at the end of the day, 
it's the author. I actually have, um, as part of that program, we were um, married, it's not a, the right word, but paired with a New York Times bestselling author who then guided us through editing our that first major draft, which by then was like maybe the third or fourth revision. And I was paired with this amazing author who will remain nameless because I have a nun in my book and she didn't like the way the nun was characterized. She's like, nuns are not like that. And I said, well, they can be. I had nuns who were like that and not all nuns are the same. And she was like, the nun has to go because she could not, she had a personal bias. And when I took it back to my writing group, with whom I'd been sharing, they all were like, no, the nun has to stay. It's a critical part of the story. So trusting your gut is so important and listening to what the editor has to say, but it's a trust relationship. Yes. You know, and, and, and recognizing that editors have biases. Yes. So it's not like we're, it's not like we're a goddess where we have a magic wand and we, everything we say is true that's not how it works no and you know and in some cases you may not resonate and vice versa the editor may not resonate with you know like what you were saying about the nun we might not you know the editor might not resonate with the writer or the topic um i know for me there's some topics that nope i i'm not I'm not able to assist with for one reason or another. And I'm sure the same goes for you. You have your strict guidelines and, and you're not going to cross that. And, and there are some writers that when they, you know, contact that editor and well, as a matter of fact, I had a conversation with a young lady who was very new to writing and she had a coach who was giving her information that just did not to her did not feel good and I'm like why are you still talking (laughs) to this person and well because she knows so much more and it's like well okay but are you doing yourself a disservice by holding on to this belief that they are up on a pedestal and you're you know you're in sitting on ground level going tell me more tell me more you know, tell me how I'm not right. Tell me how I'm doing this horrible. When in reality, it's just a personality thing. Right. And so it, I, in perceptions, perceptions are, are key in this. They are. Well. well, and I love that you brought that up because here's the secret of writing to being a great writer is you have to practice, you have to write. Yeah. And so yeah, you can get coached on how to write and you can get coached on how to build a novel or a memoir or a nonfiction. But the truth of it is the writing is just you. And all you need is a piece of paper and a pen or a keyboard and you can write. doesn't mean you're going to write well. I didn't write well in the beginning. I still have, I learn every, every time, every book I edit, every book I read, I, I, I'm learning. Yes. But it's a matter of, it's one of those very rare skills that really can be learned if you put the time and effort into practicing. Right. Agreed. And, oh, I had a thought that just popped into my head and it, it went away. So obviously I'm not to bring it up. <laughs> I don't, you know, that drives me crazy because I get caught in the moment. And it's like, oh, I need to say, and then it's like, God. It'll come to you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we hit on the two: the developmental editor and the copy editor. Uh, you know that grammar and punctuation. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Sure. Was you know we were talking about writing styles, and that is one thing that follows into that perception is the fact that whose writing style is the right there's there's different groups of um writers on 
on social media that I follow. And it's so funny because somebody will throw in that question, comma or no comma. And those are the ones with the longest comment threads because there is so much opinion on what is the right way, what is the wrong right. way. Truly, yes, you should follow, you know, the set guidelines. Um, but being consistent is the most important part, you know. When it, and so as an author and as a publisher, we use the Chicago Manual of Style because that's what's typically followed for books. And we do the Oxford comma. <laughs> Even though maybe it isn't necessary, I, I like it because it still does add clarity and consistency. So um, that is my, my firm stand on that, though I recognize that others have different opinions and may use different style guides for, you know, like the AP style guide, for example, which is really more for journalism and, and for right. essays and that kind of thing. Um, but I think a lot of it comes down to, as you said, consistency. And, and um, if you're going to capitalize a word that normally would not be capitalized, then you make sure it's capitalized throughout the entire document. And that's where the proofreader comes in, that, that blessed, wonderful person who is so detail oriented that they love um, doing that. And, and if you can't tell by the way I'm speaking, I am not that person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in grad school, we had to proofread so many things. And, and I had a stack of uh, at one, one week's assignment was three, 300 page manuscripts. And oh. Oh, I would have rather folded socks um, and going grocery shopping than, than do that. But we did, I mean, I got good at it, but I don't enjoy it. I do not. And it's not my unique brilliance for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not wanting to go through, you know, through, through the lines and, and look for those extra spaces and, and extra, uh, I call it a carriage return. It's right. You know, because that's typewriter talk. Yep. <laughs> um, because that's what, you know, we grew up. We learned on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said that to somebody and they're like, carriage return. And I'm like, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's when you get the return in extra time. <laughs> exactly. And then of course, um, you've got the, the line editor, which the proofreader and the line editor have two different roles, but in some ways, well, actually all of them overlap. They do. One way or another, they overlap. Right. So if I'm dev editing and I see something's misspelled, I'm correcting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not going to leave it. And, no. and if, an ed- if you do have an editor that leaves those mistakes on quote unquote on the page, then that's not the editor you want to work with because to me that would be it just wouldn't be nice yeah Yeah, well and I think so there's there's this perception that an editor's role is that they're going to make your book perfect oh and I I um and I don't like that idea of of infallibility because really in truth nothing is perfect and I I always say to my clients or or my authors we're going to make your book the best that it possibly can be, but it will not be perfect. There will be a typo. There will be a missing comma. There may be a a sentence splice that we didn't catch. And that's okay. As long as the book on the whole gets the message across, we're not going to be sloppy. Don't get me wrong. Right. But all books have mistakes, all books. Yes. And I say, here's the thing. The people who make Persian rugs, the Persians who make those gorgeous rugs and they hand knot all of those rugs that have these gorgeous patterns and bright colors, they actually introduce a mistake into the pattern on purpose because their feeling is that only God is perfect. Oh, I did and not so, realize that. <laughs> yeah. So I often that you'll hear me talk about that a lot is that we're not going for perfection. We're going for excellence. Yes. And the other, you know, the other thing is the perception 
of what is right and wrong because to to put somebody in the position of like you say god or the almighty or or however you want it said no one is better than the next person we all have our talents we all have our special gifts by allowing ourselves to be imperfect that to me is perfection because we're exactly. human we're perfectly being human <laughs> i love that we're perfectly being human i accept that <laughs> Good, because I don't know where that came from. But... <laughs> nice download. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I will be writing that out. That will be a quote that I put somewhere. <laughs> Look for that quote. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag trademark. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. Oh, if we could, you know, if it was only that easy, but. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, you know, and if we were to go back through and, and look to see if anybody else has said that prior, you know, and I'm not, um, you know, that copyright infringement thing. Sure, sure. <laughs> Somebody else has probably said it. <laughs> but not like you. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you and I, we are now best friends. <laughs> Thank you, Debbie. <laughs> Oh, you know, Highlander Press is a hybrid publishing company. And one of the questions that comes up is, what is a hybrid publishing company? And this is where I will leave this week's episode and my conversation with Debbie Keevan. It's clear we have a lot in common and really wild creative imaginations. In the second part of our conversation, Debbie and I will talk about the differences between various publishing options and about some of the things you can expect to do after you've written your book, such as, well, promoting. I'd like to say thank you for spending time with us. Be sure to subscribe to the Pen to Paper Press podcast on your favorite app. Share this episode to inspire writers to write and publish their works of art. You can find the show notes for this episode at pentapaperpress.com and leave us a comment. We would love to read your takeaways. One way to ensure you receive future podcast episodes is to take a moment and subscribe to the growing newsletter list. I promise not to clutter your inbox with daily emails. It's not going to happen. All right. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Take care of yourself, and until next time, know that your words have power and your story matters. Bye for now.